we are uh, we're at the end of our service, our sermon series, I should say, with regards to uh, the radical Jesus that we've been looking over for the last couple of months. And the reason I say we're at the end, we're only halfway through the book, is there's just so much information. It's 27 chapters in the book of Matthew that if I had to continue, we'd be going to well into next year with this. And that's something I will pick up, the second half of Matthew, towards the middle of next year again, and we'll continue with this, this theme again. But we need to can you believe it? We need to begin to prep for the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to begin to prep. This is that time of the year where a lot of things are going to begin to happen now. Um, as we gear ourselves towards uh, celebrating uh, the birth of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. But this, this morning we, we finish off and we're going to look at, at something I think that a lot of people really struggle with. A lot of people battle with. And that is that we often hear what people say, but we don't listen very often to what people say excited little boy comes to his dad one day and he's t- trying to tell his dad about something that had happened at school but he's, he's, he's highly excited and he's speaking very very fast and his dad says whoa 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 slow down slow down slow down talk slower little boy looks at his dad he says dad uh, I don't have to talk slower you've just got to listen faster you know which sort of makes sense sometimes if you think about it it's been said that that, that people human beings we we tend to think five times faster than we speak Okay, which if you're married to the love of your life, then guys, this is a good thing because if we did the other way around, you wouldn't get a word in edgewise. Come on, you can laugh. It's said that a man speaks 10,000 words per day, but a woman speaks 20,000 words a day. My wife says it's because she has to repeat everything, you see. But um, those are just sort of little things that we're talking about. I mean, if I'm going to speak at 120, minutes, uh, 120 words a minute today, and you're listening at 500 words a minute today, well, then guess what? You're thinking about lunch right now, aren't you? Hmm? I hope not, because you need to hear what I'm going to say this morning. Um, so either I'm going to have to talk a lot faster to catch up with you, or you're going to have to slow down in your listening as we begin to, to look at this idea of, of what it means to, to really truly listen to God, to really listen to, to the Word of God. Um, in the book of James, James 1 verse 19, uh, James touches very clearly on this issue. It's been an issue that has been around since uh, the beginning of time. This thing is not working again. I love this machine. The bigger the job, the bigger the hammer. Just move one up for me, please, Wayne, because I don't know this thing's not coming on. James 1.19 says this. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Okay. When he says take note of this, what I'm about to tell you is important. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Okay? And right there, many of us are challenged or confronted with three very difficult challenges. The first is that many of us are, are, are not quick to listen. We are very quick to speak. We, we don't listen as much as we want to talk. Um, and we need to, it is an inherent need, I, I think, today for, 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 for a lot of people to just get their opinion out there. And sometimes just getting your opinion out there tends to, to dominate a little bit the conversations that you find yourself in. The second thing is that many of us are, are so quick off the draw to speak that we don't take the time to slow down and think before we t- speak. Which leads us to the third challenge. And that is that when we speak faster than we think, very often the conversation ends up in a place of anger. Okay? Now this mindset unfortunately has found itself to be manifesting it in, in the modern, the postmodern mind psyche that we, we, we live in today, the postmodern world that we live in today. And, and so very often we, we, we've become, I think, a, a generation of um, opinionated, uh, my way or the highway type people, which very rarely is conducive to good relationship if you're going to be honest with ourselves. The story is told of Napoleon Bonaparte, just before his English campaign, was sitting in his tent, he was about to attack England, and his aide came to him and said to him, Sir, there's someone who needs to speak to you. He says, I haven't got time, but I'll give him two minutes. Now, had Napoleon Bonaparte given the man more than two minutes, he would have seen the benefits of a steamship, transporting troops by a steamship, and the European map, as we know, may be looking very different today. But he didn't give the man the time to share this invention. Robert Fulton was his name. Had he listened, well, it would have turned out a little bit more differently. And the question this morning really is, essentially, is, yes, we may hear, but are we truly listening? 
You may hear when I preach and when I, we read out of the Bible, but are you truly listening to the word of God? You may read the scriptures, but are you truly listening to what scripture is telling you as you read the scripture? Or is it something that you're just ticking off on your to-do list every single morning or every single evening? This was an important thing for Jesus, uh, for God, in fact, because when we go and we look at, 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 at Matthew 17, verse 5, oh, this thing is still not on. Yeah, don't worry about it. Just give me the next slide. Matthew 17, verse 5. While he was still speaking, this is Jesus speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And listen to this. Listen to him. We seem to think that the scripture reads something like this. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from heaven said, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Debate with him. Negotiate with him. Argue with him. It doesn't say that. It says, listen to him. It pays to listen to Jesus. It does. In fact, God knew this and he instructs us that we need to listen to the teachings of Jesus Christ. An 80-year-old uh, grandfather went to dinner at his daughter's house for one night. And after dinner, he got up, and obviously not in South Africa, but he went for a walk through the neighborhood. He said, I'll be back in about 20 minutes. Two hours later, the old man comes back and he says, sorry I'm late, but I, I stopped to talk to a friend of mine. And you know what? He just wouldn't stop listening. <laughs> Are you truly listening today. See, sometimes it pays us to listen for a long period of time, especially when it comes to listening to the Word of God. When last, let me ask you a question, when last have you truly sat down with another person and you have listened to that person without looking at your watch, without reshuffling your schedule in your head so you can still fit everything in that you need today, no matter how long this conversation may take? When last have you done that? Very few of us will be able to put our hands up there because we are ruled by this little disc on our wrist. And so we've lost the, the art, the fine art of listening to other people. When last have you read your Bible or prayed and then simply sat down, no matter how long this would take, and waited for God to respond? Again, without looking at your watch, without reshuffling your, your schedule in your head until you can fit everything into the day? And again, I'm going to say to you that very few of us do that because we're too busy. Next year, January, you guys are walking into a sermon series called Crazy Busy. And if it doesn't challenge you, then you're a brick. Because this challenged me and it's going to challenge a lot of you, especially if your diary looks like a full set of Britannica novels or Britannica encyclopedias. It's going to challenge you because we are too busy. And the first thing that tends to, t- tends to take a knock in our busyness is your spirituality. You don't have to believe me. You know that. It pays big dividends to listen to what the Lord has to say. Through a sermon, through a a CD in your car, through the television, whatever the case may be, it pays big dividends to simply sit and take the time and listen. And so this morning, what I want to do is, I, I love this, this scripture. I think the scripture was probably one of the peace, first parables of Jesus I ever truly understood. And so it has a very special place for me. Um, but this morning, I want to have a look at, at Matthew 13. Um, Matthew chapter 13. It's a story we all know. It's a story of the, the sower of the seeds. Sorry, it's so small, but I had to try and fit this whole thing into three pages. So, uh, but I'll read it for you. It's a story of, uh, of, of the sower of the seeds onto the different types of soil. And you, I mean, you know the story. You've all heard the story. You've probably all read the story in scriptures. But again, the story shows us something very, very clearly. Just how radical and unapologetic and in your face Jesus in fact is. Um, especially when we begin to take this story and we begin to filter through the eyes of, or the question of, what sort of a listener am I? What sort of a listener am I? So I'm going to read from the, from the screen there for you. Um, and we'll, go from the, we'll, we'll take it from there. Uh, chapter 13, verse 1. Later the same day, Jesus left the house and sat beside a lake. A large crowd, crowd soon gathered around him. And so he got into a boat. He sat there and taught as the people stood on the shore. He told many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen. Take note <laughs> of that word. Sorry, I haven't got a pointer. Jesus is saying, 
Listen to what I have to say, because what I'm about to tell you is important. Listen to what I am saying. A farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered them through across his field, some seeds fell on the footpath, and the birds came and ate it. Other seeds fell on the shallow soil of the underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because of the, the soil was shallow, but the plants soon wilted under the hot sun. And since they didn't have any deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among the thorns and grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, or even 100 times as much that, as had been planted. Anyone with ears, anyone with ears, what do you do with ears? You listen. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. I love the NLT version in this because it uses the word over and over and over and over. Okay. His disciples came to him and said, why do you use parables when you talk to the people? Next one. Next slide, thanks. He replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. To those who listen to my teachings, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. For those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. So if you don't listen, if you don't listen to people, if you don't listen to God, you know what suffers? Take a guess. One thing. Relationship. If you do not listen, for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away. That is why I use parables. For they look, sorry, yeah. For they look, and they don't see, don't really see. They hear, but they don't really listen or understand. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that says, "When you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear. For they have closed their eyes, and for so their eyes cannot see, and their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them." Blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but they didn't. And they long to hear what you hear, but they couldn't, but they didn't hear it. Now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seeds that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom but don't understand it. Take note, the word doesn't say the seed that fell on the footpath represents those who listen to the message. Okay, there's a big distinction here between hear and listen. All right. Hear the message about the kingdom but don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their heart. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with, with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems and are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represent those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of life and the lure of wealth. So no fruit is, is produced. The seed that fell on the good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's words and have produced a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as has been planted. You see, essentially what Jesus was saying here is that there are four types of listeners or four types of hearers in the world today. There is the hard-hearted hearer, listener. There is the shallow-hearted listener. There is the clutter-hearted listener. And there is the good-hearted listener. So I want to have a look at, at those four very briefly this morning. The first of these being the hard-hearted listener. Matthew 13, verse 19. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom but does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away, snatches away what has been sown in the heart. This seed, this is the seed sown along the path. The hard-hearted person, in essence, um, has a heart that is so hard that the gospel can't penetrate. It lies on the surface of the heart, and, and Satan comes, and he takes it away. Before it can actually grow, before it can actually begin to bear fruit, Satan comes, and he snatches it away. Now, to be clear, just because you can't grasp a specific piece of scripture in the whole of the Bible, it doesn't mean that you're hard-hearted. Ask anybody who's doing the Revelation teaching over the last couple of weeks, and we realize that we don't understand 
a lot that goes on in the Bible. It doesn't mean that you're hard-hearted. You're just not ready to understand it. We, as people, may not be ready to understand that specific piece of scripture. But there are scriptures that you will get. And you get them intrinsically, immediately, you get those scriptures because you understand what the scriptures are teaching. And then there are those people who just are not interested. The heart is so hard that the seeds just lie there and, and Satan comes and, and he simply takes it away. At one point, halftime, during the Japanese game at the World Cup, Heine Kamea says to one of his players, do you understand what cooperation is? What teamwork is? The man said, yeah, I do. He said, do you understand what matters is that we win as a team? He said, yeah, no, I do, I do. The coach says, so when a penalty is called, you don't argue with the ref, you don't swear at the ref, you don't attack the ref. Do you understand it? He said, yeah, no, I understand. He says, good, now go tell your mother to stop doing those things. <laughs> Fact is, there are some people who will not understand things in life. There are going to be people that we meet that will never understand a, a lot of stuff, okay? And sometimes it's simply because the, the, the heart is so hard that it is not willing to change. They're not willing to look at an alternative. It is just a hard heart at that specific point. Now, understanding rugby is, not, is really not as important as trying to understand the basics or the essentials of the gospel. Um, the story goes of three little boys who were sitting talking about their dads. And the first one said, well, my dad is a professor. When he speaks, only 10 people in the room understand him. The second little boy said, well, my dad's a brain surgeon. When he speaks, only five people understand him. The third little boy said, you guys have got nothing on me. My dad's a preacher. When he speaks, no one understands what's going on. <laughs> there will always be people who will hear, but they will not listen. They cannot listen. And they cannot listen because the heart that God has put in their, in, in their bodies is so hard that it rejects the teachings. Can a hard heart go soft? I believe it can. I believe it can. But there are people who, who have lived in, in, in this state for so long that this casing around their heart is made of the, the toughest tungsten carbide out. Nothing will penetrate. And if they wanted to, they could open it up, and it would. But they don't. They don't. Colossians 4. Colossians 4, verses 3 to 4 says this. Pray for us too. This is the pastor's prayer. This. Pray for us too. For God may open the door of our message that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for, I, for which I am in change. This is Paul speaking. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly. My biggest prayer whenever I get up here is that you will understand what God is saying to you. Not, not, not me. You don't have to understand what I'm saying. But you understand what God is saying through me. And, and so I, I tend to try and keep these messages very simple, except for Revelation sometimes. But that's not my fault. That's just the book, okay? Uh, but generally speaking, we keep it simple so that people can grasp the message, can understand the message. But no matter how simple I keep it, there will always be people who will not understand it, who don't want to understand it, and will not allow the, 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 the word to seep in and, and, and soften their heart. Okay. The second type of person that we want is the when? The shallow hearted listener. Matthew 13, 20 to 21 says, the one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word. So he hears what God is saying to him. Okay. And at once receives it. He takes it in, makes it his own. All right. With joy, but since he has no depth or no root, it lasts only a short time. When trouble and persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. We call them fair weather Christians. We all know those people who, uh, who love Jesus when everything's going a for away. Huh? Everything is okie dokie, but the minute they strike any sort of tribulation in their life, they turn their back and they walk. And when everything goes well again, then they suddenly come back again. Which doesn't make any sense to me because when I'm in trouble, that's the time I need to find who Jesus is. I need to find who he is that he can carry me through these times. But there are people who, who unfortunately have a very shallow perception of what life is. The shallow hearted listener's biggest issue is that they will hear the truth. And part of them even understands the truth. But they have no depth. It's a shallow life. It's a shallow heart. And they're very quick to believe and even rejoice about what they've heard. But they cannot stick to the program. 
They cannot stick to the person of Jesus Christ. Remember a couple of years ago, there was a movie called Hachiko? About the dog, Richard Gere, I think, was the actor. Uh, about the dog who, who had met this man and he became his, his, his pet. And So every morning the dog would trot off with him to the station and sit there and then go home. And in the evening he would come back and he would sit there waiting for the master to come back. Um, and even though he had, he'd, he'd only known the master for, for, for a couple of months, in 1925, one night, the man died at work. And the dog went and sat at the station and waited for his master to come. And he never came. And for 10 years, this dog would trot over to the station every evening and sit and wait for his master to return. Isn't it a shame that we aren't dogs sometimes when it comes to Jesus? Isn't it a shame that we don't have the same faithfulness when it comes to the the Lord Jesus Christ? Or the same endurance to the faith that we have put into this man? But the problem is that we're not. We struggle with this type of faithful, faithfulness. We struggle with this level of, of, of endurance. I know a number of people who, and this is no indication on anybody here, but I know a number of people who, who have started jogging or go to gym or go to an exercise. Of course, it's beneficial. It's healthy for them. But after a short time, they quit. Why? Well, because the excitement sort of wears off or the going gets a little bit tough or the schedule is too busy or I've got sore muscles or my arms ache or my shin splints or whatever the case may be. And what these people, these specific people have done, that's why I say never go to gym. Don't start something you can't finish, okay? That's all I'm saying. Um, That's why some of these people have done with their various sports exactly what they've done with their jobs. There's no endurance. There's no following through. And they've done the same with the church and with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I've been mulling, (laughs) and I just haven't been able to figure out the three points of the sermon, but I've been mulling over a sermon series in my head for the last year that says this. The title would be, Things I Would Never Do to My Boss, But I Would Have No Trouble Doing to God. Think about that statement. That's a very, very scary statement. There are stuff that we would, we would, have, we would never dare do it to our boss. He would just wouldn't go to work. He just wouldn't suddenly not pitch up for work one day, but we have no problem coming to, to church or not coming to church. We wouldn't disrespect our boss, but we have no trouble disrespecting God. Do you understand what I'm saying to you here? It's, it's, it's no indictment on anybody, but what I am saying is that we, we don't have, as people, we don't have the endurance it's only the select few that seem to be able to, to carry through this endurance and this, 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 this foresight to, to, to see the thing through. Why can't we stick it out? Why, like this dog, Hachiko, can't, can we not stick it out faithfully to the Lord Jesus Christ? Because no matter who you are in the church this morning, you may be the best Christian. There are times of unfaithfulness in your life when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. There are times in my life when I'm unfaithful to Him. You know why? Because we're human beings. We do fall, we do fail, we do make mistakes. And unfortunately, the shallow-hearted listener is the person who makes the mistake and thinks God will never forgive me for this and then just doesn't come back. Never turns back to Jesus again. And the loss is huge. The loss is massive. They don't realize the damage that they are doing. E. Stanley Jones, a very famous Christian missionary, once said this. He said, I am quite sure that I would not have survived as a young Christian had it not been for the corporate life of the church to hold me up. When I rejoiced, they rejoiced with me. When I was weak, they strengthened me. When I fell, rather a bad fall, they gathered around me to, in prayer and in love. And without blame or censure, they lovingly lifted me back up to my feet again. That's the picture of the church. That is the ideal picture of the church. A group of people who love each other no matter what. No matter what your mistakes are, no matter what your failures are, we love you. And what we want to do is we just want to pick you up and put you back on your feet. Next slide, please, Wayne. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 There's three scripture references. Just listen to what Paul says. They all come from Paul. And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help, love everyone. Romans 14 verse 1. Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. In other words, accept him who struggles in their faith without judging. You know what we're very good at in the church? Judging. We love to judge. We're very good at it. 
Romans 15, 1 to 2. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak. So if you're strong as a Christian, you need to stand with those who do not get it right. You need to stand with those who fail in their, in, in, in their faith every single day. And not to please ourselves, not for yourself, it's for them. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. You know what's a sad indictment of the church these days? And I've heard it time and time again. In fact, I've seen it happen. It said that Christians are the only people who shoot their wounded. Hmm? We, the people who should be getting it right, are the only people who shoot their wounded. Isn't that sad? I wouldn't say that holds true for everyone. But it does hold true for a large percentage. You know what we do when someone fails? When someone sins? You know what we tend to do? We tend to judge them. That's our first go-to place. We tend to judge them. Ah, but you shouldn't have done it. You should have known better. You're a Christian. You shouldn't act like that. And I realize that there are people who just can't be helped. Okay? I've seen people come through this church and and through all the other churches I've served in. People who come to church and and generally they're they're there for a short period but then the the, the fun part disappears. or, Or the excitement seems to disappear and they simply just fade into the background. There are going to be people that you will not be able to help, but God alone can do that. So, so consequently, we need to understand something. And as a pastor, that, that, that this is something I really struggle with. Um, but some people won't remain faithful. When the going gets tough, they get going in the wrong direction. Whenever they find life tough, or even the Christian life tough, they simply seem to drop out. And that is the shallow-hearted listener. He hears everything. She hears everything. But there's no depth. There's no endurance. There is no carry through. There is nothing that will help them to get through this. And you know who's to blame very often for the shallow hearted Christian? The rest of us. Because we do not encourage. We'd like to. And in our minds we do that. But very often we don't encourage enough. When we see somebody struggling in their faith, we'd rather just stay away because we're really not interested in your sad story. And Jesus just cries when that happens. eh? He really does. I think it breaks his heart when we act like that. So ask yourself the question, are you a shallow-hearted Christian? Let me give you the answer to this. What does this piece of scripture mean to you? I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not, love these words, He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forever. I love Psalm 121. If this psalm means anything to you, if this psalm stirs your heart, and it does mine too, I still want to write music to this song, but if this psalm stirs your heart, then you are not the shallow hearted Christian. Because you know that your help comes from nowhere else but the Lord Jesus Christ. And when things go bad, when things go pear shaped, when things go rough, He is the one you turn to, not the one you turn from. Okay. The third type of person is the clutter-hearted listener. Matthew 13, 22 says this, The one who received the seed that fell amongst the thorns is the man who hears the word. So he hears the word. He listens to the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. In other words, you've got stuff in the way. How many of us have got stuff in the way? I'll put my hand up because I've got stuff in the way. Most of us in this church have got stuff in the way of our relationship with Jesus. The clutter-hearted listener has a life that is cluttered up by the things of this world. I want you to listen to this prayer someone once penned about a cluttered-hearted listener. This is what he says. Dear Lord, please leave me alone. 
Let me just sit in my pew on a Sunday. And Lord, guard my heart. I'm oh, sorry, guard my seat. Please don't let anybody else sit in it because that's my seat. And you know that. Precious Lord, let me get home quickly after the service um, this Sunday before any of those really churchy people try and make me do things that I don't want to do. Lord, make me understand, or make them understand that I'm happy and content to show up on certain Sundays. Heavenly Father, thank you for hearing my prayer, but I've got to go. The game is on in 10 minutes. You understand, Lord. You know what I'm talking about. Thanks, God, for putting some of the greatest games on TV this week. And thank you for my own personal TBN, Super Sports 1, 2, 3, and 4. I'll see you next Sunday. Or maybe the next. Or maybe the one after that. Amen. <laughs> you see, some people are so caught up in things, in the stuff of the life. And essentially, these things in the long run, will mean nothing at the end of the day. Do you know what Americans gave? And I, and I, I use Americans because not because they're a bad nation, they're wonderful people. I just use them because they've got fantastic ability to statistify, stat, statistify everything. That's the word I'm looking for. Statist is that an English word? I think it is. Yeah. They have statics, statics, statistics for everything. Last year, the Americans gave $2.9 billion to overseas missions. Wow. It's impressive, eh? It's a lot of money. What's that in, in Rand? Four and fifty, I think. Yeah. It sounds pretty good until you put it into context. Do you know what Americans spent last year on movies? Eight point four billion dollars. They spent thirteen billion dollars on chocolate. Twenty three billion dollars on toys. Twenty three billion dollars on their pets. Twenty four billion dollars on jewelry. Fifty eight billion dollars on soft drinks. $85 billion on garden and home care, and $354 billion on eating out. Oh, oh by the way, $2.9 billion on outside mission. <laughs> Does this sound like a nation? And let, let's add us all into this. Does that sound like a people who is interested in God? Hmm? You know when you go to a person, you say, listen, tell me about your interests. Can anybody yet tell me that the first person somebody will mention to you is God? Oh no, I like golf and I like racing and I watch TV and I, and I, and I, I, I love going to the dam and I love fishing. Um, oh, oh yes, yes, and then and, and, and God. I like God too. I think God's pretty cool. Is this a, a nation and a people who have their priorities right when, oops, when it comes to the spirituality of, oh, now this thing's on again. Is this a, a nation that has its priorities right when we have to list Everything that we keep ourselves entertained with, and somewhere down the list, God pitches up on, the, on, on this list. When in fact, God has to be the first interest that we have. But He's not. He doesn't feature anywhere near the top in many, many people's lives. Remember last week I said to you that, that wherever your heart, was last week or the week before, I can't remember, wherever your heart lies, there your, come on, there your treasure will be. Okay, wherever your heart lies, there your treasure will be. For the cluttered hearted listener, his treasure doesn't lie in the eternal. That place which he will spend for the rest of his eternity, his treasure doesn't lie there. It lies in the things that he accumulates here and now. Things that he cannot take with him. I've never ever, and I've said this before, but I've never ever seen a fainted trailer behind a hearse. You just don't see it because you can't take anything with you. And the cluttered hearted person gets so caught up in the here and now in having the best of this and the best of that and, and collecting all of this that they fail to see that the minute they die, it means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. Let me put this into context for you. God sacrificed his only son for your salvation. Does that move you? See, none of you are nodding, which scares me because if that stopped moving us, then we are taking Jesus Christ for granted. God gave his only son so that you can have salvation. You know when you're going to realize this? One day when you stand before that throne and God looks down on you, then you're going to realize it. And for some it's going to be too late. God sacrificed his only son for your salvation. Let me give you another statement. Jesus gave up his life for you. Are you moved by that? 
I see some people nodding, so maybe there's a bit of movement here. And all he asked was that you give everything you accumulate in this world to him before you go. No, he didn't say that. He said, just have faith in me. Believe in who I am. And this morning, if you are sitting here, and you are asking yourself, well, am I possibly this uh, clutter-hearted listener? Well, then, you know, answer these questions for yourself. Does where I spend my time reflect my dedication to the giver of all eternal gifts? Does where I put, I don't know if that's English, does where I put my money truly reflect my dedication to the one who paid the ultimate price for my soul? Is what I do reflective of the actions of a father who sacrificed his only son so that I could stand before him one day redeemed because of faith in him and not faith in stuff? If, 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 if those questions are not answered satisfactorily in your own life right now, then you're blessed. Because what these questions do is they give you time to begin to course correct. They begin to give you the time to correct the course of your life. If you die, that old saying that I saw in so many bumper stickers in the 80s, he who dies with the most toys wins, there should be a little addendum to the bottom of that says, wins what? I don't care how many things you have. I don't care how many stuff you've got, how many cars you own and how many houses you own. I don't care what you have in your account or what's the best and latest gadgets you own. I don't care. Jesus doesn't care about that. In fact, God doesn't care either. But you need to figure out, are those things going to truly in the long run make you happy? And truly in the long run, are they going to assure your salvation? No, they won't. Only one thing. And only one thing can do that. Next slide, thanks, Wayne. The good-hearted listener. This is the one that I'm hoping we all strive to be, but this is also the one I think we fail at being the, the most, each and every one of us, me included. Okay, Matthew 13, 23 says, But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. So, the word falls on good soil. He hears it. He understands it. But that isn't enough because Jesus goes on. He says he produces a crop. What does that word produce mean? It bears fruit. You see, I can hear it. I can internalize it. I can understand it. But if I do nothing about it, it means deadly squat. It produces a crop yielding 100, 60, or 30 times what was sown. The good listener hears the word of God. In fact, three out of the four that I've spoken about so far hear the word of God. The good listener understands. Two out of the four does this, understands the word. But only one out of the four allows it to begin to bear fruit. You see the difference between the four I've spoken about? There's a very subtle difference between them, but only one gets it right. And isn't that God all the way around? God says, well, this is what you need to do. And we create a whole set of parameters within which we can do it. And, and each is, 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 is very similar to the last or similar to the next. But essentially, if we stripped it down, it isn't what God has commanded us to do. So you need to hear the word. Uh, essentially you need to hear it and you need to listen to it because by listening it you begin to understand the word and if you truly understand the word and you persevere through that understanding then you begin to bear fruit now who of you believe that you're bearing fruit we all are if you're a Christ following Bible believing Christian as I'm hoping all of you are then you are bearing fruit but the problem is (laughs) <laughs> and, 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 and this is, I think it's Luke 14, if I'm not mistaken. Luke 14, Luke 15. Um, we bear fruit up to a point. And then we stop. Do you know why? Because we don't allow God to prune us. Remember the story of the vine that Jesus speaks about? Now, I'm not saying go outside of the lawn in front of the church and go, Lord, prune me. You don't want that. 
God, you don't want God to take to you with a weed eater because that's not what you want. But God knows how to prune and he knows how to prune properly. Because once he prunes, we begin to bear the fruit. We begin to bear the fruit that he needs. Do you know what pruning looks like in many of your lives and many of my lives? Take a guess. Hmm? Hardships, struggle, bad health, financial issues, difficulty. You know why I say that? You know why we seek God in those places, in those times? It's because we've got nothing else left over. The person who, who never has an issue in their life, who never has a struggle in their life, they're never going to truly seek God because they've never truly needed Him. I, 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 maybe I should clarify that point. If you're a good follower of the Word and you follow the Lord Jesus Christ and you don't have any serious issues in your life, it doesn't mean that you're not getting it right. Maybe you are well balanced enough to place God in the right perspective. You may be the wealthiest person or the poorest person in the world, but you have the right balance to place God in the right place in your life. And as long as you place Him there, no matter what the circumstances look, you will grow forward. But for many of us, we are obstinate. We are hard-headed. And the only way that we will turn to God is when we have nothing else left. Isn't that scary? Because Jesus in Matthew, I think it's Matthew 11, comes and he says, I came to give you life. Life in abundance. Do you really think God wants us to struggle? No, he doesn't. He wants to bless us. He wants to pour out his blessings of us. But our decisions take us to places we shouldn't go. Our actions take us to places we shouldn't go. We end up not buying into this abundance because we are not obeying the word of God. We are not understanding the word of God and we are not showing the fruit that he so desperately needs us to. And so God doesn't cause cancer, but he will use cancer in your life to turn you to him. I'm using cancer as an example. Money, retrenchment, loss of family, whatever the case may be. He doesn't cause those things. Life causes those things, but he will use those things to Turn you back to him. And what do many people do when that happens? They turn from him and they walk away from him because they blame him for what is happening. School teacher <laughs> asked little Johnny one day, he said, Johnny, tell me what is the difference between perseverance and obstinacy? Johnny thought about this for a second. He said, teacher, I know. He says, the one is a strong will. And the other is a strong won't. Makes sense. Perseverance says, I will. Through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, I can. I will see this through. I will walk this road. And I will do it because he is the one, Psalm 121, that looks over me, that takes care of me, that is in my life the whole time. The obstinate individual says, I can't. I won't. It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. Ever seen a happy, obstinate person? Not so much, eh? Have you ever seen a happy, strong-willed individual? Yes, I do. Yes, I have. Man walked out of church one Sunday morning. He said to the pastor, Preacher, that was a fantastic sermon. But I just can't seem to connect it to my life. <laughs> this person is not a good-hearted listener. You know, I say that. I say that because at the end of the day, I'm a firm believer that we do not meet Scripture at our greatest point of need. Scripture meets us at our greatest point of need. And I'll tell you something. If you were listening to what I said to you this morning, not just hearing, not just hoping that you can get to wherever you need to get after, after church, but if you listened to what I said this morning, something would have resonated with you today. But a lot of us sit here, we hear, and so we miss. But we don't listen, and when we listen we begin to see. A while later a young lady came to the same process and she said Preacher, that was an amazing sermon. I'm going to do something about this. This has changed my life. That 
is the sort of person that has become a good-hearted listener. She has taken maybe one simple statement, one simple word, one whatever out of that whole message. And I'm not saying you must take everything I say and, and, and make it yours. Uh, but if one sentence or one statement simply touches you, then you have become a good-hearted listener. You are open to the prompting of the Holy Spirit in your life. James, next one, uh, James. Uh, Wayne, sorry. James 1.22 says, Do not merrily listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. So Jesus was saying, or James was saying, I suggest you listen to what I say, but you know what, don't act on it, it's fine. No, that's not what he says. He says, do not just listen to what I'm telling you, but so deceive yourself. Because if you just listen and do nothing, there's no point. You're deceiving yourself. You need to go do what it says. In the old uh, King James Version, it says, yea, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. The word is dead. The word of God is dead unless we pick it up and we begin to work with it. Wayne, you know this. You, the minute you started studying, your, whole, your eyes were open to what the Bible really says. But people don't want to put the energy into this. We need to take what the word says and go out and do something with it. The story is told of a, a lady of high society who, who went to an art gallery the one day. She said to the curator after seeing a, a, a thing on the wall, she said, my dear fellow, I've never seen this painting before. It's rather hideous. It's a crude image and I really, really don't like it. What do you call this? The curator turned and said, madam, that's a mirror. <laughs> James 1, 23 Next one, Wayne. James 1.23. It's a scriptural reference, I promise you. Anyone who listens to the word, listens to the word, but does not do what it says, is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. See, you can listen to the word. But if you are that person just listening and not doing anything, you see your face, but when you walk away from the mirror, you can't remember what you saw. And after that, verse 24, looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But, and this is it, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. In other words, whoever looks into the word of God that gives us freedom and continues in it, works in it, works with it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, acting on it, will be blessed in what they do. You cannot expect God to bless you if you know your Bible backwards. You can only be blessed and expect to be blessed by God if you are acting your Bible backwards. The Word of God is not paper and ink. It is a living, vibrating, moving, morphing, growing thing every single day. If it wasn't, then I will tell you that when you read the scripture the one, at one day and you read the same scripture the next and it suddenly means something, then it's just a book. It is not. Remember, scripture will always meet you at your greatest point of need. You can't go to the Bible and go and find an answer for yourself. If God isn't willing to reveal it to you yet. We need to begin to work with the word of God. It cannot sit on our shelves. It cannot sit under a layer of dust in our library. It cannot sit on, on, a, on, on a table somewhere. It cannot look nice in my, on my coffee table. It has to be a book that is tattered and torn it is a book that has more highlighting ink in it than the week. A book that is falling apart at the seams. Because if that is the Bible of a person who is act sorry, if, if, if a person owns a Bible like that, then I'm going to tell you something right now. That person knows how to work with the Word. But if you have a pristine in its package Bible that has never been opened and it perhaps just briefly leafed through, it's a waste. Of the word. Jesus in Revelation 3.20 says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens that door, I will come in and eat with me, him and he with me. My question to you is simply this. 
Can you hear that knock? Okay, let me change it. Are you listening for the knock? Because you can hear the knock sometimes, but you're not listening for it. Jesus says, I, I'm knocking. And he's knocking on each and every one of our hearts right now. I don't care how good you are as a Christian. I don't know how far you've walked in your, in, in your, in your, your journey with him. He, Jesus never stops knocking. And all he wants you to do is open the door. How difficult is that? He doesn't want to come have lunch with you. He wants to come and do life with you. But you see the thing is we open the door and we invite him in just for lunch. And when we finish with him, we put him out again. Are you really listening to what he has for you? Or are you just hearing it? So what? I'll tell you something out of personal experience that when I begin to listen to the word, when I begin to slow, and I'll be, I'll be dead honest with you. There's some mornings I get up, I pick up my Bible, and I read it. And if you had asked me what I read after it, I wouldn't be able to tell you. I wouldn't be able to tell you because I've got so much else happening in here that I'm not taking note. And I've had to train myself over the last couple of months to slow down. And sometimes it means reading a piece five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times over in the morning. And not, not a whole chapter, just that one piece. Because I, I go past it and something says to me, this is important. And I go back to it and something says to me, it's important. And I, eventually I find myself reading this thing over and over and over until I understand what I'm reading. But there are some mornings I get up there and I think, well, that was pointless. And I'm sure many of you feel the same way. I'm sure many of you.